Okay, we're going to continue on with review of pre-calculus today. This is part two of five, I think. And you get the subdued voice today because um, Simone's sleeping in the next room. So I'm sorry if it's a little bit quiet. Uh, all right, so today is an interesting lesson because some of you have already taken pre-calculus 12. And if you have, you've done all of this stuff except for the very last part of the lesson. If you haven't done pre-calculus 12, you're currently doing it right now, you probably haven't done any of this at all. And that probably seems a little stressful that I'm reviewing it when you haven't even learned it. So um, the good news I have for you, though, is this is low importance in calculus. Will you ever need this? Yeah, on some particularly um, complicated or probably better word is annoying questions, you might need to use this. But we could probably get through the whole course without using it at all. Um, but for completeness sakes, I will teach this to you. If you're doing pre-calculus 12, you'll learn this in more detail later on. So we've got a couple theorems, or a few theorems, to go through. The first one's remainder theorem. And the remainder theorem says, if a polynomial p of x is divided by x minus a, the remainder is p of a. Now, what on earth does that mean? Okay, well, if you look down here, we have a polynomial, p of x, and the polynomial is x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus 5x squared minus 4. And we're going to divide it by a binomial of the form x minus a, right? In this case, x is, or sorry, a is 2, so we have x minus 2. So what this theorem tells us is, if we want to know just what the remainder is when we divide the polynomial by the binomial, if we only want to know what the remainder is, we don't care what the answer is, um, we just want the, rema the remainder, all you have to do is figure out what's p of a. And remember what we said a was? a is 2. So you just have to figure out what p of 2 is. What does that mean, p of 2? It just means plug 2 into all these x's. So you'd have 2 to the 4th minus 2 times 2 cubed plus 5 times 2 squared minus 4. So 2 to the 4th is 16. 2 cubed is 8 times another 2 is 16 again. 2, to the f 2 squared is 4 times 5 is 20 and then minus 4. And 16 minus 16 is 0 plus 20 is 20. Take away 4 is 16. So what I'm asserting here is that if you divided this polynomial by that binomial you get a remainder of 16. Now, it actually ends up, this is a pretty complicated example to do by long division, but let's just take a simpler example. Let's say we wanted to know, let's say that our p of x is 3x squared plus 5, and we wanted to divide that, so I'm going to put divided by uh, x plus 1. And if I just wanted to know what the um, remainder is, then all I would do is I'd take my a value. Now careful, what's the a value since it's plus 1? It'd be negative 1. So I just put p to the negative 1 equals, well that's 3 times negative 1 squared plus 5. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3. So you'd have 3 plus 5, which equals 8. So let's see if this is true. Let's actually long divide that. So if I put x plus 1, into 3x squared. Okay, you have no x term here, so you have to put plus 0x and then plus 5. Long division is actually important in calculus. You will use it, so I think this is worth doing. Uh, and now let's divide. You ask yourself, how many times is x? What do you have to multiply x by to get 3x squared? You have to multiply it by 3x. So I'll put that over the x term. 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times 1 is 3x. And then I subtract all of that. So when I subtract, 3x squared minus 3x squared is 0, and 0x, take away 3x, is negative 3x, and then I bring down the plus 5. Do the same thing. What do you have to multiply x by to get negative 3x? You have to multiply by negative 3. Negative 3 times x is negative 3x. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, and we subtract all of that. When you subtract, negative 3x take away negative 3x is just 0, and 5 take away negative 3 is the same as plus 5 plus 3, and that equals 8. Our remainder is 8. Hey, remember what we said the remainder is right here? 
8. This will always work. This is how the remainder theorem works. It's very useful if you only want to know the remainder. Now, notice if we wanted to know this amount right there, the remainder theorem doesn't help us. But believe it or not, oftentimes we just want to know the remainder. So that's how that works. Okay, let's move on to the factor theorem. The factor theorem states that a polynomial has a factor, x minus a, if and only if p of a equals 0. And this should make sense. When you divide something by a potential factor, the way you know it's a factor is, is if you get a remainder of 0. So for example, if you wanted to know, say you weren't very good with multiplication, and you were like, I wonder if 7 is a factor of 16. Then what you would do is you'd go 7 into 16 and see what you get. Okay, well, 7 goes into 16, 2 times, 2 times 7 is 14, with a remainder of 2. Oh, we have a remainder. 7 doesn't go into 16. But if you said, hmm, I wonder if 8 is a factor of 16, you'd say, how many times does 8 go into 16? 2. 2 times 8 is 16. 16 minus 16 is 0. Yes, we got a remainder of 0. And because we have a remainder of 0, 8 is a factor of 16. So for this exact, exact reason, if you want to know whether a polynomial has a factor, x minus a, all you have to do is use the remainder theorem and then see if you get a remainder of 0. So let's try that. We want to know is x plus 1 a factor of this polynomial? How would we figure that out? Well what we would do is take the a value, remember the a value is negative 1, and we'd plug it in to the polynomial. So we're going to have 5 to the negative 1, 4 minus 3 to the negative 1 squared, plus 6 to the negative 1, plus 4, and we're going to figure out what this equals. Now, what does it have to equal if it is a factor? It has to equal 0. I'm not saying it does. I'm saying if it's a factor, it will equal 0. If it equals any other number than 0, it's not a factor. Then x plus 1 is not a factor. So let's see. Negative 1 to the 4th is just 1 times 5 is 5. Negative 1 squared is just 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6 plus 4. So we have 5 minus 3 is 2. 2 take away 6 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0. So our answer here is yes, x plus 1 is a factor of this polynomial right there. What about x minus 1? Well, you can probably guess the answer, but let's just go through it. If we want to know whether x minus 1 is a factor, we would plug the a value, which is 1, into the polynomial. So we'd have 5 times 1 to the 4th minus 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times 1 plus 4 equals 1 to the 4th is 1 times 5 is 5. 1 squared is 1 times negative 3. 6 times 1 is 6 plus 4. 5 minus 3 is 2 plus 6 is 8 plus 4 is 12. Is x minus 1 a factor of this polynomial? The answer is no. Why not? Because this number here is not 0. If it's any other number except 0, it's not a factor. It has to be 0 in order to be a factor. Okay, the last one, the rational root theorem. The rational root theorem says that the possible rational roots are, is equal to the factors of the constant term divided by the factors of the leading coefficient. So what that means is, if I was trying to factor something like this, which looks pretty darn complicated to factor, because we don't really know how to factor cubics, right, that 3 there, cubic, unless we could factor out an x or something, and we can't, we don't know how to factor them. So we need to guess. Believe it or not, you'd actually have to guess at one of the first factors. So you don't want to, you know, there's an infinite number of numbers you could put into x here. In order to get a, a smaller set, can still be a pretty large number of them, but to get a smaller set, you're going to use this fact. The possible roots are equal to the factors of the constant term divided by the factors of the leading coefficient. So let's do that for this first question we have here. Uh, the factors of the constant term. So what I'll do, I'll put right here, possible roots equal. Okay, factors of the constant term. Which one's the constant term? This is your constant term, negative 6. So what are the factors of 6? Factors of 6 are 1, 2, 3, and 6. Right? Those are the numbers you can divide 6 by. Wonder why I put these big gaps in front of them? Because it could be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 6. But here's the thing. You have to divide that by the factors of the leading coefficient. What's the leading coefficient? This is the leading coefficient. It's the coefficient in front of the biggest exponent. So what are the, co the um, 
what are the factors of 4? It's plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 4. So these are all the possibilities. So let's go through them. You could have 1 over 1, which is just 1, so plus or minus 1. You could have 2 over 1, plus or minus 2. You could have 3 over 1, plus or minus 3, and you could have 6 over 1, plus or minus 6. Now we're going to go 1 over 2, so we could have plus or minus 1 half. Um, 2 over 2, well, wait a minute, 2 over 2 is just 1, and we already have it, so that's done. 3 over 2, so plus or minus 3 over 2 plus or minus 6 over 2, but 6 over 2 is just 3 and we already have it. Okay, now let's put them all over 4. Plus or minus 1 over 4, we've got to put that one down. Plus or minus 2 over 4, well that's just a half and we have that one. Plus or minus 3 over 4, don't have that one yet. And plus or minus 6 over 4, but that's 3 over 2 and we already have 3 over 2. So these are all our possibilities. How many do we have? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, but each one of those has a plus minus, so we actually have 16 possibilities. Okay, does that mean that all these work? These are all roots for this um, polynomial that we have right here? No, it doesn't mean they all work, not at all. But what it means is the ones that do work would have to come from this list. So you have to guess one of those. Now, 16 is a lot of possibilities, but it's a lot better than the infinite number we you know, had before we used the rational root theorem. So here's your little hint. Start with the whole numbers, right? Your textbook isn't always nice, but often they'll be nice and they'll make sure it's like plus or minus one or two or three or something like that. So that's what I would do. I would start with one of the, uh, the whole numbers. Sometimes you might have to go all the way to the fractions, which is a real drag, but let's just hope. Now, we have to find something that's actually a factor of here. How are we going to do that? We're going to use the factor theorem. We're going to try to find one that has a remainder of zero. How are we going to find the remainder? We're going to use the remainder theorem. We're just going to plug in a into the polynomial. Let's try 1. See if that works. So p of 1, if we say that this polynomial is equal to p, right? So if we put 1 in there, you get, I'm going to do this quickly, 1 cubed is 1 times 4 is 4, 1 squared is 1 plus 12 is 12, 1 times 5 is 5 minus 6. Does that equal 0? No, it does not equal zero, so it's not a factor. It didn't work. You'd have to try another one. Now, you could take a long time to do this. I already know one of them that works. I know that negative two works. So let's just put negative two in here and see what happens. So I have four times negative two cubed plus 12 times negative two squared plus five times negative two minus six. Negative two cubed is negative eight times four is negative 32. Negative two squared is four times 12 is 48. 5 times negative 2 is negative 10 and minus 6. And negative 32 take away 4, or sorry, negative 32 plus 48 is 16. Take away 10 is 6. Take away another 6 is 0. So it worked. We figured out that negative 2 is a 0 or root. That's therefore, right? Negative 2 is a 0 or a root. So what that means is that x plus 2 is a factor. If negative 2 is a 0 or a root, then x plus 2 is a factor. So now what we have to do is we want to factor this completely. We've only got one factor. How are we going to get more factors? Well, one thing we could do is we could just keep trying all of these factors, all these possible roots, all these possible zeros. But we don't want to do that. That's going to take too long. So what you'd actually do at this point is you would divide the polynomial by the factor that you just found. How are we going to do that quickly? because we could use long division like we did up here, but it takes too long. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a faster method besides long division? Guess what? Such a thing exists. Here it is. We'll come back to that question we just saw. This is called synthetic division. This is a shortcut for long division. That's the good news. The bad news? You can only do it if, it's the, if the divisor is a binomial of the form x minus a. So, for example, in this example you could do it because it's x minus 2. This one you could do it, it's y minus 3. But if you're dividing by x squared minus 2, you couldn't do it. If you're dividing by y cubed or something, you couldn't do it. It has to be like this. So what you do is, I know this is ridiculous, but I draw a flag, flagpole with a flag and the ground, right? It's the way I think of it. And what, I, what goes on my flag is, if this is the factor x minus 2, then what's the root or what's the 0? It is 
2. So that's what goes inside. Then I write all the coefficients here, making sure I don't skip any. So I have 5x cubed, I just put 5, negative 13x squared, negative 13, 10x, so 10, and then negative 9. Okay, here's the way it works. It takes a couple times to get this. It's not really complicated. It's just a memory thing. You drag down the 5 and you multiply. 2 times 5 is 10. Then you add negative 13 plus 10 is negative 3 and multiply again. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Add again. 10 plus negative 6 is 4. Multiply again. 8. Add again. Negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1. Here's my, here's my answer. But what does this mean? I just have this collection of numbers. Well, starting from over here, this is our remainder. This is our constant. Or if you want, this is when it's x to the 0. That's what a constant is, right? x to the 0. This is our x to the 1 term. This is our x to the squared term. Uh, if there's another one, it would be x cubed, x to the 4th, etc., etc. So what that means our answer is, if you put the whole thing together, is we have 5x squared minus 3x plus 4 with a remainder, I'll just put the big R like you used to do in elementary school, a remainder equal to negative 1. And that's the answer. So let's do another one here. We're going to start by drawing our flagpole on the ground. What do we put on the flag? We put, since the factor is y minus 3, we put plus 3. Then I put all my coefficients. Now this is written in a really bad order because our um, the degree of this polynomial is 5. So our leading coefficient is right here. It's negative 1. So you'd have negative 1 for the, the fifth. Then for the 4, you have 2. So we have 2, 3, negative 1. For the 2, the y squared term, there is no y squared term. So what do we do? We put 0. There's no y squared term. For the, the y term, y to the 1, we have 4. How about the constant? There's no constant. We've got to put 0 again. Okay, now we're set up. We're ready to go. Drag down the first number and multiply. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. Add, you get negative 1. Multiply, negative 3. Add, negative 4. Multiply, negative 12. Add, negative 12. Multiply, negative 36. Add, negative 32. Multiply, negative 96. Add, negative 96. Oh my gosh, that's a big number. So we've got remainder, constant, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. So what our answer is, is negative 1 x to the fourth minus 1 x cubed minus 4 x squared minus 12 x minus 32 with a remainder of negative 96. And I can tell you it was much better to do that um, with synthetic division than to do that with long division. That would have taken us a long time. Oh, I've made one mistake here. I'm so embarrassed. See the mistake? This question had no x's in it at all. It was all y's, so I should have y, 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 y. Why, why, why must I make so many mistakes? Okay, let's go back and finish this one then. So we have found that x plus 2 is one of our factors, and we want to find all the factors of this polynomial. So what we can do is we can divide the polynomial by this. How can we do that really quickly? with synthetic division. So we put negative 2 in there. We put 4, 12, 5, and negative 6, and we're ready to go. Drag down the 4, multiply, you get negative 8. Add 4, multiply, negative 8. Hey, I'm going to stop right here. What number do you know should go right here? What's the, what should the remainder be? Since this is a factor, should be 0. Sure hope it works. 5 plus negative 8 is negative 3. Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0. It worked. We have a remainder of 0. So what's the uh, polynomial that's left here? This is our constant x and x squared. So we have 4x squared plus 4x minus 3. And we have to keep factoring, right? We have this one factor, but we need more factors. So what we do now is we factor this. But we have good news. This is a quadratic. You know how to factor quadratics. Uh, factor. So this you can factor by using Bobby Bridge. So what are we looking for? Two numbers that multiply to 12 and subtract to 4. 6 and 2. So we've got 4x squared 
plus 6x minus 2x minus 3. We're going to pair up this and this. Take out uh, 2x in this one. So you have 2x plus 3. Take out Gray's common factor here is negative 1. So you again have 2x plus 3. So what you're left with is 2x plus 3 and 2x minus 1. So when you factor this here, if you factor it completely, a lot of people will put this as their answer. What are they forgetting if they just put that? They're forgetting this one. We already found that this was one of the factors. So slap that on at the front or the end or something like that, and this is your final answer. You have now factored that completely. That, my friends, is how you factor cubics. If it was a quartic, if it was a, you know x to the fourth, you'd have to do this guessing thing twice, and then you could go to a synthetic division after that. Okay, let's finish this off. Now, this last part is the part that people taking pre-calculus 12 might not know as well, so listen up, those people. So we're going to try to factor this completely. Now, we need to figure out a number that would work when we plug it in here so that we get a remainder of 0. And I'm hoping you can think of something pretty quickly. 1 would work. So why don't we go straight to synthetic division here. Put 1 there. Now, careful, what are you going to have? You're going to have 1x cubed, no x squareds, no x's, and then negative 1. And let's do synthetic division. Drag down the 1, 1 times 1 is 1, add 1, 1 times 1 is 1, add 1, 1 times 1 is 1, add 0, which is great, which have a remainder of 0. So what we're left with is, if we turn this into a polynomial, this is constant x, x squared. We have 1x squared plus 1x plus 1. And then we try to factor this. So let's try. We're looking for two numbers that multiply to 1 and add to 1. Is there any such thing? No. So in other words, you can't factor this anymore. When we factor x cubed minus 1, what you end up with is this, this 1, but what's the factor if that's the root or the 0? If that's the root, then the factor is x minus 1. And then we also have this, this x squared plus x plus 1, which we can't factor any further. So this is factored completely, which takes me to a very important thing called the difference of cubes. You know difference of squares, right? If I gave you something like x squared minus 9, you know how to factor that. It's x minus 3, x plus 3. You've done that many times. But what we have here is a difference of cubes. We have x cubed, and 1 is the same as 1 cubed. These are both cubes. Let's see if we can end, um, come up with a formula for any difference of cubes. Turns out it's a cubed minus b cubed equals a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. Now, how the heck did I get that? Or how could I use that to get the same answer I got here without doing synthetic division? If I recognize that this was a difference of cubes, difference because it's minus, and both of these are cubes, perfect cubes, how could I do this? I could think to myself, well, what's a in this case? If I match it up, a is x. What's b in this case? b is 1. So then I would just plug in a minus b would be x minus 1. Yep, that's what we have there. Then we have a squared, which is x squared. Yep. ab, that's a times b, or x times 1, which is just x. Good. And then b squared, that's 1 squared, which is 1. So we get exactly that. It works. So you can always use a difference of cubes as long as you spot that you have one. So here's a difference of cubes right here. What's our a and what's our b in this? The b is easy. What do you cube to get 64? you cube 4. What do you cube to get x cubed y6? You cube x and you also cube y squared. So we can plug that into this formula up here. So we end up with a minus b or xy squared minus 4 times a squared so that's xy squared squared plus ab so that's 4 times xy squared times b squared. So that's 4 squared. Let's go through and simplify. xy squared minus 4. Then we have x squared and y squared squared. Well, x squared is x squared, and y squared squared is y to the fourth. Plus 4xy squared plus 4 squared is 16. We did it. We used the formula to figure this out. Looks more complicated than the original, but it could actually be useful when you're doing, using calculus uh, to find limits and things like that. Okay, this was a difference of cubes. What if it was a sum of cubes? Well, first of all, remember with a difference of squares, which you've done many times before, difference of squares, easy to factor. 
What about a sum of squares? What did we learn about factoring those? Can't do it. You can't factor a sum of squares. But you can factor a sum of cubes. So let's do that. Let's factor this. We'll start by doing the same thing we did over here. We'll try using synthetic division. So we need to think, um, use, need to use the factor theorem. Think of a number you could put into x here so that you get a remainder of 0. Can you figure it out? Negative 3 would work. So we put negative 3, then our coefficients are 1, 0x squared, 0x, and 27. All right, away we go. Drag down the 1. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. Add negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. Add 9. Negative 3 times 9 is negative 27. Add 0. Great, that's what we wanted. So what are we left with? We're left with x squared minus 3x plus 9. Can we factor that? I don't think so. It would be two numbers that multiply to 9 and add to 3. Can't do it. Don't forget this factor. This is just a root or 0 here. But since it's negative 3, our factor is x plus 3. OK, can you figure out what the uh, formula must be for sum of cubes? I bet you can do it. If we had started with a cubed plus b cubed, what does that mean that a is and b is in this right here? It means our a is x and our b is 3 x cubed is x cubed, 3 cubed is 27. Now, if you compare to our answer, what do you think that means the formula is? Well, we have x plus 3, which looks like a plus b. Then we have x squared, well, that must be a squared, minus 3x, well, that looks like multiplying these together, so a, b, and then 9. How do you get 9? b squared. There you go, that's the formula for a sum of cubes. Let's use it down here, and we'll be done. We have a sum of cubes because we have two perfect cubes. What's a and what's b? b is easy. b is just 1. 1 cubed is 1. What cubed equals 27x cubed? That would be 3x. If you cube all that, you get 27x cubed. So now all you have to do is plug those things into our formula. We have a plus b. Well, that would be 3x plus 1. Then we have a squared. So that's 3x all squared. Be careful, not just the x squared minus AB, multiply those together, you just get 3x, plus B squared, 1 squared. So nothing you can do there, 3x plus 1, 3x all squared is the same as 9x squared, minus 3x, 1 squared is this equal to 1, and we're done. We used our formulas here to get the sum of cubes factored and difference of cubes factored. Okay, boy, that was epically long, I apologize, and the cruel joke with all this is very little of it will actually show up in calculus. Probably the most common thing will be this, difference of cubes and sum of cubes, and that will mostly be at the start of the course when we're dealing with limits. Okay, um, don't worry, not all the classes are going to be this long. You, you're in my mind, you're in my heart, I wish I knew right from the start of my